everybody? It's good to be with you. I was in Portland, Oregon five hours ago, but I'm not there anymore. <laughs> um, I'm right here, happy to be here. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Genesis, if you want to grab a Bible and turn there. It's real close to the beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1. There's actually no page number in these type of Bibles. It's just they figure you know, you know how to get there. Um, Genesis chapter 1, we're going to be. Uh, we do have an internship coming up this summer. We love the internship. It's a lot of fun for us. We've done it for a few years now. Um, and we have some more spots available for anyone you know that would like to. It's basically about 10 hours a week or so. Um, and and they, they are, you know, help us out around here. They get some training in different um, areas within the church, as well as they get a lot of discipleship. And um, it's a fun community to be a part of. And uh, we've always, you know, it's always been young people, but we don't limit it to young people. Some of you not as young people um, were saying, hey, you know what, that might be fun to go hang out with some people and, and uh, see about, you know, what the Lord has me doing and all that. It, it could be good. So just so you know, um, kind of broaden the horizons there a little bit. And we do need housing, though, for some of the people. We actually have um, probably, you know, five different international um, interns that are going to be coming this year. And so we do need some housing. If you have an available room or um, something like that, then let us know, and that would be helpful. Uh, I think that's everything. We also, were, I mean, we're going through our Other Hours series, sermon series. God doesn't want to make you good at church. He wants to make you good at life, the other hours, all the other hours of life that you're not in church, because if all Christians do is get good at church, we stink. We're horrible. We're worthless. We're no good. Um, we need to be good at life. The Lord needs us to be good at all the other aspects of life, all the other hours of life. And we've broken those other hours as best we can into five different segments that we're going to be doing, you know, sermon series on, but we also are um, having classes and online curriculum on these things. But um, the first one is relationships. So we did a bunch of teachings on relationships. Um, it's a big part of life. And we have a book that we recommend and a study guide and all this stuff on livingstreams.online if you want to go check that out. And then today we're actually going to be starting our second section called work. 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 Ah, work. I don't work. It's my weekend. I'm not supposed to talk about work because it's coming tomorrow like a big monster. You consume me. Um, some of you put your phones down. I know you're working right now. Just kidding. I don't know anything. Um, but work, we're going to talk about work because that's a big part of our lives. Um, whether it's work you get paid for or if it's just you got to work to keep the house in order. And if you have kids, you're working. Um, if you have a dog, you're working. If you have a cat, I don't know what you do. Never had one of those. Um, but it's a, lot of, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of work in life, and it makes up a huge part of our life. And I, I didn't say this first service, but um, there, was a, there was a lady that came and spoke at our financial forum uh, last Wednesday, and she was talking about the future of work, and she's, there's all this interesting stuff happening. But one of the things she said was that um, there's a research that's been done that's basically studying the recovery process for people who have gone through different traumas, whether it be, you know, like sexual abuse or divorce or they just kind of went through these, these, these things that happen in society and what it is, you know, what the time frame and, and the intensity of the recovery to get people back to a place where they're whole and healthy from these things. And they said they've done all these things, but there's one trauma that they have not yet been able to do any research and find any conclusion as to how a person can recover from that because the intensity is so intense and the duration seems to be so long. They've never really had a research thing for that. And it's long-term unemployment, which is wild, huh? Long-term unemployment is so traumatic on the soul of a human being that they're really trying to figure out how to find someone who's been able to get right after it. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't out there, and you might be like, I'm one of them, and people are like, well, I don't know how right you are, but that's a whole other discussion. You guys can deal with that on your own. But it, it just goes to the core of who at work is very important. We need, we need to feel like we are contributing to something. 
Just like we need water, just like we need food for our bodies, our souls, we need to feel like we are a contribution in some way. And if we don't, and if the enemy starts to play on that and we start to believe lies, real damage can happen. And so we're going to talk about work. We're going to talk about it for a few weeks. I'm going to try and set some things up today um, to, to get us to start the discussion. And, and what I want to do with that is share some visions so the other day, we were praying as our direction team, and uh, we were talking about society, talking about some of the challenges we have. Um, right now, you know, there's a lot of weeds happening, because for some reason, Arizona thought it was supposed to rain all winter long. Um, and the weeds are, I mean, I go in my backyard, and I go back inside, because <laughs> the weeds, there's weeds as big as me. Um, and it's funny, because they just started flowering, so I'm kind of like, well, it's kind of pretty. <laughs> it's not too bad, right? Brit, you know, not too bad. And she's like, it's horrible. Um, and so I don't know. There's a lot of weeds. But we also see in our society, you know, those of us who are paying any attention, there's a lot of weeds growing up. Uh, there's a lot of challenges. And there are people who have said, you know, the cities of America have become post-Christian. And I... I can see it, you know, and I think some cities maybe are a little further along than, than other cities, but, you know, it makes sense that, that, that we're on trajectory to be post-Christian. And one of the people on our executive team, she, she was praying that we wouldn't become post-Christian in Phoenix. And it was funny because I had, I had already, the ship had already sailed as far as I was concerned. I was like, wait a second. And it just kind of struck me as, this is our city. This, this is our city, and the church here is strong. There are so many awesome churches around here. Don't tell them I told you, because you should come to this church, but there are. If you go to another church, that's cool, too. But there, there are so many great churches and great believers in all different aspects. Of, and I thought, you know what? We shouldn't be giving this thing up. It doesn't matter where we are. There can be revival. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead dwells in each one of us who have made him the Lord of our life. And, and it, we don't need to, I mean, we obviously need to adapt and kind of change depending on what the world's going on. We have to figure out how the gospel can take root. And I mean, there's all of those things. But at the same time, we can also just pray that the Lord says that that's enough and just makes a total revival and puts a passion in our hearts for this city, and we stand in the gap, and we see the decline start to change and turn around and go into a different direction, and this place actually becomes a city known for its Christian influence and community. And so that was a little challenge to me, and um, there's this thing I came across. This was an Anglican priest in 1925 who, who was remarking on his culture and his society, and he came up with these seven social evils. And we don't have time to go into this. I mean, this could be a whole sermon series in itself. But I want to share it with you guys as just kind of something maybe to prick your hearts and help you see society a little differently. But the first one is wealth without work creates all kinds of evil. Wealth without work. Pleasure without conscience. Now, again, these first things, none of these are bad in and of themselves, but when they're not coupled correctly, they become evil. Knowledge without character, commerce without morality, science without humanity, religion without sacrifice, politics without principle. And that last one, we're all like, <laughs> whatever. Um, but that's basically stuff that we can see, and, and this, the guy was getting to the root of some of these things. Um, and that, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing our society. I mean, we're, none of us are probably that proud of a lot of things that are going on. Um, and we're a little confused, and it seems like things are just so bad. But this is our chance to, to really stand in the gap, to war against these things. And, and the work that God has called us to do um, is to do that. And we'll, we'll get into that more and more. Tim Keller, he's a, a, a pastor, a Protestant um, pastor in, uh, in uh, New York, and he's spent his life trying to uh, build God's kingdom there in New York City, <laughs> which has got all kinds of issues. And this is something that he's, I just listened to a podcast, this is something that, that he has a, a desire, a vision, a, a passion from the Lord for. 
He says he wants to see churches working together to see the gospel transform lives, producing radical philanthropy, profound racial reconciliation, and real social justice. And I love this because we don't want necessarily, I shouldn't say it that way, we want to see God move in our church services, right? We want to feel his presence and we want to hear his word. But if you had a choice and God said, I'll either show up for you at church this Sunday and really minister to you and all the people there, or I'm going to show up for you at your workplace and minister to all the people there, which would you choose? You'd choose the work every single time, right? Yes. God, God wants to move in the lives of people who don't know him, who, who don't experience him, who haven't tasted and seen of his goodness. And so the cry of my heart, the cry of Kim Keller's heart, is that God would move in the church. Yes, we want that. But more importantly, the movement wouldn't get stuck here and bounce off the walls, but the movement would flow right out of this place and that God would start to move and God would start to cause change, that God's power and love would be known outside of the churches. That's what transformation is. That's what transformation is. That's what we're hoping for. And I would add to profound radical philanthropy, racial reconciliation, real social justice, this just kind of simple prayer, that everyone in our city, our society, would, would just know the love and power of our risen Savior. I mean, that's just, that's a passion. That's a vision. That's a hope. That somehow we would carry the love and power of God into every pocket of this city. So whether or not people respond and we get to see anything grand and awesome, I mean, I pray for that and hope for that, but I would love it if just everyone got a taste of who our Jesus is. And the, and the true love and the true power that is in him and in his spirit. And so I had a vision this weekend as we were doing a worship time at this conference. And uh, this is what I saw. I saw the sky getting cleared over Phoenix and over Belize, but never mind that. That's my own business. <laughs> and what was causing this sky to be cleared was the praises of God's people. That, that as we met and gathered, not just our church, but all the churches in Phoenix, it was like the sky was being cleared. And as the sky was being cleared, it kind of opened up this portal of some sort, and, and I saw this city coming down. And, and I mean, I was immediately went to Revelation 21, where it says that John was looking, and an angel showed him, and there was this city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. And it was beautiful. And it looked just like a bride dressed for her wedding day. And we know in the scriptures that that's a picture of, of the church. And somehow as we, the church, clear the air, it's like the true picture of God's kingdom and his beauty, it can come down. And everyone can see it and feel it and know it. And I just started praying for our city. I prayed for, and I was praying for Belize and the churches there that I've worked with. That we would take up our position that we would see that what we're doing is not just kind of a routine. It's not just something we're just checking off boxes. But when we gather and we call on the name of the Lord and the churches all over Phoenix, as they cry out to the Lord and they sing these praises, the praises arise and they clear the air over the city for the blessing and beauty of God to come. You have a very important role. God didn't save you so that, that you could just hang out. He saved you so that you could become a mighty warrior and do the work he's called you to do. So with all that said, we're going to go to the book of Genesis and we're going to get the vision of, of the, the writers of the Bible um, inspired by the Holy Spirit and see what kind of vision they have for work, um, the biblical perspective on work. And uh, let's read. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 is where we're going to start. 
Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals. I love ruling over the fish. Every once in a while, I get to rule over one as it bit my line and I'm reeling it in. It's, it's one of my favorite moments of all time, especially if it's a big one. But anyways, I, you know, rule. God made the mankind to rule, to rule. Please catch that word. And in that word Hebrew, it's, it's a powerful rule. It's a king. It's God made you and I to rule. And we'll get more language like that as we keep going. And then in verse 27, it says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Just in case anyone was thinking, anyone was thinking that God made man to rule and Eve was part of what he was supposed to rule, the writers clear that up real quickly and say, No, God made man and woman both as mankind to rule over the rest of creation. And God blessed them, verse 28, and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature. So there God says to them, Not only have I made you to rule over the creation, but the command goes further. I, I want you to be fruitful, increase, and fill the whole earth and subdue the earth. Now again, this language is intense. Rule over the earth. Subdue the earth. In another place, God gave them dominion over the earth. Those are very particular words with a particular message. And part of what they were supposed to do is have this authority to rule, to have dominion, to subdue the earth. And they were supposed to be fruitful multi and fill the whole earth. That's what, that's what we're being taught here. That was God's plan. The work that man and woman, mankind was supposed to do, was they were supposed to rule over the entire earth, filling the entire earth, subduing the entire earth, having dominion over the entire earth. That's what God created them for. Created you and I for. And the word there in Hebrew can kind of go both ways. It can be rule and subdue and have dominion in order to create flourishing for everyone involved, common good. Or it can be ruling, subduing, having dominion over so that you can make sure you flourish and you have good at the expense of everybody else. But that's what we're called to do. We're called to work in a way that we subdue, we conquer, we, we have dominion. But God's wanting us to do it so that it feels like a garden for everybody <laughs> instead of feels like a slave camp for everybody. You get the point there? And you see how we've gone astray in that situation as a, as a, as a people. The next thing, turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating he had done. Just in case you didn't know where work came from, God is where it came from. Your job came from God. <laughs> I don't know about that. You, you can say that. But the idea of work <laughs> came from God. It's, it's a holy, sacred thing. God himself worked for six days, rested. God is a worker. He's a worker. When you and I work, we're, we're, we're connecting with the Imago Dei, the image of God. We're falling in line with what he made us to be. Um, skip down to verse 15. Genesis 2, 15. The Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So the Lord God put man in the garden. So this is kind of a retelling of Genesis 1. Genesis 1 is real poetic, and this is kind of a little bit fuller commentary of, of the creation process. And it's saying that God made the man, and he put him in the garden to what? To work it and take care of it, maintain it. And then if you skip down to verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. 
Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals, all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So basically, this again, a, a kind of non-poetic telling of the details. So God put man in the garden and said, I want you to work it and take care of it. And then man wasn't that good at it. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. And, and he had dominion over the animals. He actually came to them and he named them all this stuff. It's like, you know, he was supposed to have dominion all these things and it was easy. It was easy because of the way that the world was set up at that point. It wasn't laborious or hard for him to take care of and maintain this garden. But something was missing and God said, we're going to make a helper suitable for him. And obviously we know this is more than just somebody to work with him. It's someone to become bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh and someone that becomes one. And, and the idea of marriage was instituted. But we're talking about work right now. Talk about relationships last week. So you can go check all that stuff out. But work is something that God made at, Adam and Eve, male and female, to work this garden, to take care of it, and if we add the other language, to then make the rest of the world a garden. Because remember, God took the world which was without form and void, and he made a garden. Put Adam and Eve in it and said, now you work for six days on this garden to care for it and further it, and then rest. Work for six days on this garden to care for it and further it and then rest. That is basically the whole situation. And that's what they were doing. That's what was happening. We don't know how long. But then Genesis chapter 3 happens and what happened? Sin. Adam and Eve decided they knew better or believed the lie that the devil was telling them and didn't take God at his word and ate of this tree Maybe they felt like, hey, we grew that tree, or we were in charge of the garden. We have dominion over everything, even though God put a limitation on it, and they did it anyways. And sin came. And when sin came, do you remember what sin brought into the garden? It brought a curse, right? And what was the curse brought onto? Labor. Labor. You see how holy and sacred Work is that when, when the first mention of sin comes in, the curse, the damage that sin does was on the work, the labor. Women in childbearing, I've heard it's labor. I don't know if it's true. <laughs> that's a joke. That's a joke. Wow. Whoa. Man. Um, the second thing was, and, and, and the fields, it would be labor. It would be challenge for the fields. And basically, entropy began. The second law of thermodynamics. There it is. Weeds. Whereas before, taking care of the garden and making it further was, was, was easy because there wasn't a curse. But now, because of sin, there's a curse. So it, check this out. Work is not cursed. Work is holy and sacred. But there is a, re a reality of sin that has brought a curse that affects the work. It doesn't mean we shouldn't work anymore. It doesn't mean work is worthless. Work is still what God did and wants us who, live in, who are in his image to continue to do. But now it's harder and challenging and difficult because of the reality of sin. Here's me trying to sum it up. God's work was to make a garden out of the formless void of our world. He worked for six days on that garden and then rested. He put mankind in the garden to enjoy it and fill it and expand it. When man sinned, the curse that came was on labor, labor in childbearing, labor in the gardening work. Because of sin, there is entropy in the second law of thermodynamics. Mankind's job in the beginning was to maintain and further the garden, the goodness of God's garden. Mankind's job is still the same today. Therefore, your work at home, in an office, in a shop, in a studio, in emails, in spreadsheets, in classrooms, in your vehicle, in research, in your children, in your relationships, it is sacred and holy work. You might think your job is lame, but God sees you as a special agent sent and planted 
in your work situation. Even if your work is lame. <laughs> There's so much more to it. Ephesians chapter 1 in the message says, I, Paul, am under God's plan as an apostle, a special agent of Jesus Christ, writing to you faithful believers in Ephesus. And then he goes on into one of Paul's awesome run-on sentences about the wonder and beauty of God and the amazing work of salvation and, and how much God has meant to him. And then he sums it all up with this. He says, it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're supposed to do, what we're living for. Long before we first heard of Christ we got, and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. The call is the same. Nothing has changed. Jesus has work that he wants you to do. And if you will give your life to him, and you will trust him, he will not only point you in that direction, but he will fill you with passion, his passion, to accomplish it. And this is really my prayer for us over these next few weeks, that we would be gripped by the passion of God in the direction that he wants us to work. You see, Jesus, when we're next week, we're going to celebrate Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday, you know, marks this moment where he rode this donkey into Jerusalem, and, and then the next week of his life leading up to the death and resurrection, they call it Passion Week. It's the Passion Week. Jesus was passionate. He was gripped by the Father's heart for the work that God wanted him to do. So gripped by it that one point they described him that his face was set like flint towards Jerusalem, towards the cross. He was so compelled and constrained by what the Father wanted that he was willing to do anything and everything, including being crucified on a cross, to accomplish the work that God wanted him to do. And I want us to be gripped by that passion. Do not come next week if you're scared of the passion of Christ. Because my prayer is that we will be gripped by his passion for this city for your job, for your family, for your kids, even if they drive you crazy. But whatever work he has called you to do, it will be coupled with his passion. And his passion is dangerous stuff. One time, Jeremiah the prophet, he's like, God, you told me I'm supposed to keep telling people what you say, but every time I do it, I get beat up or thrown in a dungeon or laughed at. I'm not going to do it anymore. And then this beautiful passage in Scripture, he says, but your word was like a fire in my bones and I could not hold it in. Your passion burned hotter and brighter than any pain I ever experienced. And Paul also said in a different place, they were asking him, why are you so crazy, Paul? Why are you so radical, Paul? Why are you you know, left everything and gone to all of these people who don't know Jesus and you're building tents and you're doing, why are you so like crazy about everything. He said, well, I'm not crazy. It's the love of Christ that constrains me. He said, so the love of Christ has gripped me. I have a passion for the Gentile people. I don't know where it came from. I don't even necessarily know if I wanted it, but it is the most life-giving thing I've ever experienced, and I'm not going anywhere else. And I want, maybe the Lord's going to give you a passion for whatever weird job you have or cool job, or lame job, whatever, and you all of a sudden, you just start loving your job. And you just have such a passion about it. People are so confused, and, and you get to tell them about Jesus. That's what we're praying for, passion for the work that God has called us to do. So turn all the way to the last page of your Bible, Revelation chapter 22. It's page 849 in this thing. And we're going to see that God's garden idea it's God's garden idea. He never gave up on it. He's still into it. So Revelation is kind of showing us a picture of, of what God wants things to be. And we'll make things. Chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and down the middle of the great street of the city, in the New Jerusalem, on each side of the river stood the tree of life, which 
by the way, was in the Garden of Eden. And, and that tree bore 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of all the nations. It's a garden. The throne of the God, or the, uh, oh, sorry, and then the next line is the best line of all. I almost skipped it. No longer will there be any curse. It'll be garden without weeds. It'll be relationship without weeds. It'll be dominion, subduing, reigning, ruling without selfishness. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light or of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. What does that mean? It means we're not going to be sitting on a cloud playing a harp. I guess unless that was your job. We're going to reign. What does that mean? We will continue to be gardeners, maintaining the good of the garden and furthering it. And I, that's, ask me the next question. I don't know. I, I got the, I've got a thousand questions too. But that's the picture we're given. This gardener thing, God's pretty serious about it. And that's why every once in a while when you make something beautiful, there's this pleasure in your heart. That's why when you're unable to contribute in some way or feel like you're contributing in some way, there is such anguish in your heart. You're killing your own nature. This work thing is a very serious thing. It's a very serious thing. And I'll close with this, um, this quote from a book. It's a book called Garden City, and it's actually up on our living streams online for everybody that goes to church here, or if you listen online or whatever. Um, it's, it's a book that I think is very helpful in understanding work and this whole idea of garden coming out of the scriptures. And we got a little study guide to go along with it. Um, but it's that, it's that same concept that God has made you, he has fashioned you for a work. And it, it very well could be the work you're in is the work he wants you to do or is preparing you for something, but it, there's something kind of bigger and broader than just what job you have. Again, your work might be raising your kids, taking the formless void of your kids. <laughs> the wild, untamed, what is going on there, and fashioning it into something beautiful. And that is a holy, sacred work. Maybe one of the most holy and sacred works. Your marriage, your household, whatever it might be, whether there's kids or spouse or not. But this quote uh, from the book is helpful. It says, you are a modern day Adam and Eve. This world is what's left of the garden and your job is to take all the raw materials that are spread out in front of you, to work it, to take care of it, to run, to subdue it, to wrestle, to fight, to explore, and to take the creation project forward as an act of service and worship to the God who made you. Real simple. And some of you are doing this well. Um, our finance director, Anthony Diarcos. This guy comes to these finance meetings and he's made these spreadsheets that are beautiful. I can't understand any of them or what they're saying, but they're beautiful. And they're, I mean, the time, and, the, and then he does these PowerPoints and he's talking, and I'm just like, ah. But it's just like, wow, this is beautiful. He's pouring his heart and soul into this thing and it's, and it's beautiful and it's work and it's causing this place, this corner of Phoenix to be a place where it feels like a garden not just for you and I, but for asylum seekers who are crossing a border having no idea what's going to happen. And next thing you know, they're living in a house and having people care for them. It's definitely not what they had in, in mind. Or kids who are aging out of the foster care system 
They come and they live in this giant house and they keep telling me, they're like, this place is nice. And there's room for them. And people taking care of them. And on and on and on. And you guys are doing so many things. And we're working on this corner, brother. We, we got to take this to all the corners. Whatever corner of the city you're in or you're on. Maybe it's just a cubicle. Maybe all I got is a cubicle or, or a desk or just a corner. Maybe they put you in the corner at work. You just have to sit there. Whatever it is, that's your corner. Make it beautiful. Make it a place that everybody, when they go by, they're like, oh, I just want to go hang out here for a little bit. And they just stop by. They got to talk to you. Do that. Don't wear a crown like you're a king and you're going to subdue things. That's weird. But next week, we'll talk a little bit more about how to find the passion and how to make sure we have the authority to subdue in the way we do. Or the message title next week is, Should You Quit Your Job? <laughs> So we'll see what happens there. But let's pray. Jesus, we do thank you so much for your word that enlightens us and your spirit that impassions us in the direction that is good for us and the whole world. And Lord, I pray that this city would have revival, that this city would be struck by your passion because it is so prevalent in your people. Help us to do our part, Lord. Help us to work your work in this city. If you're someone in this place right now that really does feel a bit, a bit cold or dry, or like you had passion and it's kind of old and, and dead now, in any part of your life, whether it's in your marriage or in your family or at work. And you would like the Lord to touch your heart by his spirit and fill you and grip you with his passion. If you're crazy enough to want that, would you just lift your hands up, both hands and just the attitude of surrender and, and receiving? And in addition to that, if you're someone that maybe has never been gripped by the Spirit of God and you know you're a bit aimless, you're a bit lost, you're a bit unsure if you're really making any difference at all, and you would like Jesus to come in and guide you and lead you and fill you with his passion, you can lift your hands up too. Jesus, you see all these hands. You know exactly what's going on in their hearts. And I pray that right now, by your Spirit, in this moment, that you would come with your fire, your holy fire. You would come with your living water, your torrents of living water. Lord, that there would be new wine. There would be anointing. There would be passion, your passion, that it would grip our hearts. In Jesus' name.